In this video, we are going to see different techniques to model a system. For example, we saw in the previous video that for a DC motor, the torque to voltage transfer function is Kt upon SL plus R, where Kt is the torque constant, L is the inductance and R is the resistance of the motor. But how do I find this transfer function? Let us find out. Now, before you design any controller, you should definitely know how your system behaves or what is the model of the system. But as a control systems engineer, you might come across different hardware and different situations that are not very straightforward. One of the possibilities is, you already know how the system works. For example, you know how this DC motor works. In other words, you know what are the underlying equations that govern the system. In this case, you can write down one equation for the electrical quantities, one equation for the mechanical quantities, and a third equation which links the current to the torque. Now, you also know the values of R, L, J, etc. This is the best possible scenario. You just substitute these values and find the transfer function by taking the Laplace transform. I have written down the torque to voltage and speed to voltage transfer function. And there you have the model of your system. Job done. You can tune the controller now. But it is not always that easy. You might know how the system works, that is you know what are the underlying equations, but you do not know the values of R, L and J. In this case, either you will have to measure the parameters or you will have to estimate them. But there is one more case, where you do not know anything about the system. It is a black box to you. In this case, you will have to do the task of system identification. These three scenarios have names to them. The first one is called modeling from first principles. The second one is called grey box modeling and the third one is the black box method. In this video, we'll see both the grey box and black box methods. We'll start with the grey box method. You know something about the system, but not everything. In the DC motor case, you do not know the values of R, L and J. We will first see how to measure these values. I can give a small voltage to the DC motor and check the final steady state current value. The resistance of the motor is nothing but V by I and in this case it is 2 volt by 1 amp which is equal to 2 ohms. We have found the resistance. Now we know the time constant of the current waveform is given by the value L by R. So we can check how fast the current waveform is rising. We know in one time constant the current would rise to 63.2% of the final value. We can just check out how much time it has taken and then equate it to L by R and find the inductance. It's easy, right? Yes, it was easy in this case. But this technique will only apply to the DC motor case. If your system is different, for example, you are tuning a heat exchanger control system, then you have to come up with your own measurement techniques. And it is not always easy to measure the parameters. For example, you still have to find the inertia of the motor. It is not straightforward to do that and it also depends on what is attached to the shaft of the motor. This is the main drawback of the grey box modeling technique. First, you cannot always measure all the parameters. Second, you are not even sure whether your equation have included all the intricacies of the system. So what do you do? You can move ahead with the basic calculation of these parameters, tune the controller based on these values and then fine tune it later. We will see how to do the fine tuning in the next video. But we have another option. If you cannot measure the parameters, you estimate them. Now, there are a lot of ways to do this. I will attach a link in the description where you can check out how to do parameter estimation in MATLAB. And finally, just treat it as a black box and let us identify the system from scratch. This will bring us to the black box method or the system identification method. You do not know anything about the system. So how do you identify it? Well, we will use the MATLAB system identification toolbox to do it. The idea is, you give some input voltage to the DC motor and you measure the speed of the motor. You know the input, you know the output and then you try to guess what the system is. MATLAB has done a good job of guessing this system in the system identification toolbox. Instead of using MATLAB, you can also check out some system identification algorithms if you want to do it in real time but that is not the subject of this video. Let us go to Simulink now. Here, I have modeled the DC motor using the same equations that we saw earlier. Ideally, I would like to do system identification on a real motor, but since I do not have one right now, let us assume this model is the real motor. We will give a step input to it and we will check the output. Let us run the simulation and check out the signals in the data inspector. We can see how the speed rises to a 1V step input. 
We have also added measurement noise to the speed as this is how the sensors generally behave. Considering that these were the input and the outputs that you would get from a real system, we will use them in the system identification tool. First, we will log these values into the workspace. and then open the system identification toolbox. The next step is to import the time domain data that we logged. Now you can also filter the noise using preprocessor but we will not do that now. Let's see how the system identification works with noisy data. We will set the number of poles as 2 and the number of zeros as 0. This is where it's helpful to have some knowledge of the system rather than assuming it as a complete black box. If you did not know anything about the system, then you have to try out different combinations of poles and zeros and see which model resembles closest to the original system. It shows me that there is an 87% fit. That's great. Let us add this transfer function to a Simulink file. Run the simulation and compare it with the model output. This is a good match. The output from the derived model is very close to the output from the original model. But we should also validate our new model with different inputs so as to confirm that the new model behaves reasonably well for all kinds of inputs. Let us run the simulation again. It matches well. So system identification works for us. But we have a catch. What we have assumed here is that the system is linear. But not all systems are linear. Let us understand this statement using a few examples. In the most basic temperature control system, when the temperature exceeds the threshold, you turn the heater off. And when the temperature falls below the threshold, you turn the heater on. This on-off system is non-linear in nature. Let us see the magnetization curve of a core. We see that it is linear in some region and then it starts saturating. Luckily, we operate in the linear region in most cases and so we do not have to worry about the saturation. But what about static friction? If there is a heavy box kept on a table and you apply a force on it, this box will not move unless a sufficient force is applied that exceeds the resistive force of the static friction. Now consider a big motor. You cannot rotate the shaft by the touch of your hand. You have to apply sufficient torque for the motor to move. This is the static friction and the cogging torque. So, you may never find a system that is completely linear. There will always be certain non-linearity which you have to take into account. But how do you mathematically define non-linearity? All systems that follow superposition and homogeneity are linear systems. If any one of this rule is violated, then it is non-linear. Pause here to see these equations. So, how do we control non-linear systems? That would be an entire course on its own. But in this video, we'll see the simplest method. Let us linearize it at an operating point. For example, in the case of static friction, we are not worried much about the non-linear region as we know that the system is linear after that. So we can select this operating point for example and then linearize this system around it. You might also have to linearize a system at multiple points if the system is highly non-linear. I am not going into the mathematics of linearization but let us get a quick look at how Simulink can help us. Here, we'll mark the input and outputs as point of linearization. Then, we'll go to the model linearizer app and then we will select the operating point. We will select the step input and there we have the linearized transfer function. It is as easy as what you saw. Let us put this transfer function into Simulink and see how it compares to the model we developed using first principles and using system identification. Pretty good I would say. Now, we can complete a closed loop system, add a PID controller and tune it for the models that we derived. In the next video, we'll see how to tune this controller using different methods. So, we have seen a lot of different techniques to find the model of the system and I hope you do make use one of these in your next project. See you next time.